I'm here to talk to you about the Safe Start um, Early Childhood Mental Health Services Child Saving Institute in collaboration with Heartland Family Service, another Omaha agency, developed the Safe Start program as we call it. Um, in the summer of 2005, we had Dr. Joy Osofsky, who you were introduced to through the Helping Babies from the Bench video earlier today, um, come and do some training. And the work that we do is based on the prevent model that's used in the Miami Safe, Safe Start initiative. So, um, referral criteria, Safe Start services are for families, children age five, families with children age five and younger. And the two primary services um, are the parent-child relationship assessment and parent-child therapy. We added family support services as an option um, back in the development stages and quite frankly we haven't used it a whole lot. You will um, note as we kind of go through here that, that these services are primarily office-based for some reasons that I'll explain later and I know all the, all the great reasons to go out and provide home-based services and the vast majority of services that I um, am involved in are home based and so the home, the family support was intended to be a follow-up service that would go into the home and help the family practice those skills that they're learning in therapy um, if necessary. The reality is it's often necessary but oftentimes they have other treatment providers that we can work with to do that so that they don't have they're not flooded with tons of people coming in. Um, Dr. Hall did a great job this morning of laying the foundation um, of why these services are important. So I don't have to backtrack and go over all of that. Um, the Safe Start program goals basically to strengthen or repair the parent-child bond, to promote the child's social and emotional development. Um, we always do a screening, a developmental screening using the ages and stages questionnaires through the, through the process so we can um, get a good sense of where the kiddo's at and to minimize the harmful developmental consequences of disruptions in care. More on referral criteria. Um, this one right here I, I think is really important. Referral at the earliest possible stage of HHS involvement. Really, this service is designed to look at how is that parent and child interacting? How is the parent responding to the child? Then what do we need to do to be able to help that child or that parent um, become the best parent that they can be? Hopefully to um, promote that reunification process or inform um, concurrent planning. I got a call I don't know, a few weeks ago from a case manager um, in the central service area and she was interested in learning more about Safe Start but really what she wanted to know was um, as we got to talking she, she was working with a four-year-old and a five-year-old and these kiddos had been in foster care for years since they were both very small and um, there was a lot of discussion and the case was going to TPR and what she wanted um, us to do was do an assessment on mom and kids and on foster parent and kids and then tell her who the child had who the children had the strongest attachment to well they've been living with the foster parent for three plus years through that critical attachment period that Dr. Hall spoke of who do you think the child or that both of those children have the strongest attachment to right I said I'll save you some money and I'll tell you I'll, I'll give you the I'll give you the end of that right now um, and then we talked about some other things that could be done um, to help get those kiddos to permanency some other referral indicators multiple disruptions severely abused witness extreme violence etc actually I'm going to tell you these are some dated we're up into the 20 or low 20s of families referred and served at this point it was a pilot project still is a pilot project with um, NDHHS working um, really closely with Judge Johnson's family drug treatment court uh, and trying to launch it into some other areas. It is a replicable service and so um, you know if you're sitting here and you're thinking wow this would be great and how do we get this going on in our areas um, I'd be happy to talk with you about that. Just some other information you have in your pocket in your packet um, you know, the, the delays experienced by kiddos in the system. Um, some more information that I think 
we have addressed pretty well today. So I'm going to zip through protective factors. This is no great news. Anybody in this room, I think, um, if you're here, you probably understand this. Um, you know, but I think it's really important that the healthy, positive parent-child bond be recognized as a fundamental protective factor against abuse, neglect, and multiple risks. We know that, I mean, we talk about how important it is for that child to have a strong um, attachment to the caregiver, but I, I see it really as a two-way process because a parent who has a really strong, secure attachment to their child, that bond with that child, is much less likely to abuse, neglect, or allow somebody else to hurt their child. And they need to be attuned to the kiddo's cues and, and needs in order to pr promote that healthy attachment. One of the <laughs> programs, one of the other programs I work with at CSI um, is our Young Parents Program, and we're working primarily with adolescent parents. And it's really hard, really hard to teach those 15, 16, 17 year olds about how to attune to their infant's cues and how to be a responsive parent. Because what's a teenager's job? Right? Who are, the, who are they most concerned with at their stage of development, right? Themselves. They're very egocentric. They're trying to establish their identity. And anybody who is parenting an adolescent knows very well it's all about them. And so now they have a baby, and we say, well, no, no, no. It's not all about you anymore. Sorry. It's about this little person. And, and we worked with, um, with a teen parent in, um, in this program, in the Safe Start program, and, and provided dyadic therapy to her. And one of the first things that um, the clinician had to do was help her understand that, you know, because she'd come in and, and, and drop the baby on the floor and, you know, put some, scatter some toys around, and then she wanted to talk about what, you know, the boyfriend of the moment or, you know, what she did last night and, you know, she was, you know, wanted to text and do those sorts of things. All very normal for her developmental stage, but certainly wasn't doing much to get that baby back to her, back to her care. Signs of concerns, signs of concern um, have been reviewed. So the parent-child relationship assessment. We're talking about a structured, observation-based, multi-session assessment of the relationship between the parent and the child. One parent, one child. We're not observing, we're not assessing both parents and the child together. If we're assessing mom and dad, then we're doing separate assessments. We really want to be able to evaluate that particular dyadic relationship. Um, the assessment components. First we do an initial interview of the parent um, and get you know all the history that we can. If there's records out there then we um, request those records of the case manager, try to review as much as we can so we get a good understanding of this parent's history and this child's history. We do um, a structured ob observation of the parent and the child. If we're looking at a different caregiver sometimes we will um, observe, do an assessment with a parent, a mom, and a baby, mom and a two-year-old, let's say, and then we're going to assess the dad too, so we do a second observation. Um, sometimes we will have a foster parent come in and do um, an observation of that foster parent and that child together, which can be really important for um, a couple of reasons. Um, not for the reason, as I mentioned earlier, to determine who the child has the most secure attachment to, but um, I can think of a case where we we looked at first we saw the child with the mom with the biological mom and the clinician came back and we videotape all of these this is one good reason why we we do these um, assessments and do the therapy office space is because we like to be able to observe the parent and the child between, you know behind the window and see how things are going when there's nobody else in the room but we also want to videotape and use those videotapes to inform the assessment because you can't catch all the nuances the first time out you know sometimes we look at those interactions over and over so we can uh, you know really pick up on what exactly is going on there with the mom with the child this child um, was about 18 months old and didn't respond at all in fact there was some discussion about maybe there was something else going on something neurologically based uh, maybe the child um, you know needed to be screened for autism I mean just totally totally blank same child with the foster parent acted developmentally appropriate. Like it was the difference. I, I thought of that case when we watched the still face this morning. It was like 
you know, the difference between the baby with the non-responsive faced mom and the one who is interacting. And we never would have picked that up if we hadn't seen that child with the caregiver, with the day-to-day -day caregiver. So um, that can be really important. Morning time's preferred um, due to age of kiddo because, you know, I think as somebody earlier said today, you know, we're tired babies, don't do, you know, it's not a good time to visit. Well, it's not a good time to assess them either. So assess that relationship. So some of the things that we're looking at through the one-way mirror, some of the, it's a very structured, as I said, but you know, we're looking at free play. And it's very age appropriate, developmental, sta developmental stage appropriate. So we have um, toys and activities that are available um, that correspond with the developmental stage of the child. So, you know, we say, mom, go, go on in and play with your kiddo. Show, it, show us how you play. Now, as you can imagine, this can be a pretty threatening, overwhelming sort of proposition for parents. Um, one of the biggest challenges um, we have experienced is getting parents in to get them engaged in the process. And when I think about that, I, I really do understand it. You know, you think about a mom um, whose child is in foster care, who's, you know, involved in uh, family drug treatment court maybe and is struggling to get clean and sober and and then we say, and you know what, we want to assess how you're doing. You know, we want to assess your parenting skills. So we don't say that to them, but that's what they hear, right? We want to watch and see, really, um, you know, judge how you, how you do. And we, we really don't think you do very well. That's what they hear, no matter how we couch it. So um, we have to work a lot on the front end to get them engaged, um, you know, if they're being referred. Um, you know, through the court, then to, you know, to talk with them. This is, this is our opportunity to help you become the best parent that you can be to this particular child. It's not here, you know, we're not here to judge you. We're not here to, um, you know, point out everything you're doing wrong. So, you know, we've observed the play, um, bubbles. How many people have, have done bubbles with like a preschooler? How awesome is it to play bubbles with a kiddo? And it's great to watch the parents. And, and you can see that's sort of the icebreaker oftentimes. Get out the bubbles and, you know, and, and they'll play and they'll chase them and they'll pop them. But then you can see those parents that um, are kind of stiff and they don't really know what to do. You know, they, they, don't, they don't know how to play. Um, clean up and transition to new activity, that's always interesting. Um, and we do a brief separation, or for the, for the smaller kiddos, we do that withdrawal of the parent's face and observe how the kiddo does with that separation and reunion. The um, specific categories that we rate parent, uh, parents' uh, interactions on are positive affect. You know, do they have a positive affect with the kiddo? Do they appear withdrawn or depressed? Um, irritability, anger. Um, in the Helping Babies from the Bench video, the, the mom that they showed and, you know, how she was on the floor playing with the puzzle and she was going, stop that, or however she was saying, you know, she was pretty irritable. Um, intrusiveness. I watched a tape of a dad of a four-year-old and he had actually um, recently gained custody of this child after not having much of a relationship with him for the past, you know, his whole life, uh, and um, he was really trying hard. He's really trying hard, but really wanting this kid to, to kind of be perfect. He kind of had this idealized notion of this kiddo. And so you see them and they're building Lego. They're building a Lego airplane or whatever, you, you know, and they're trying to build. The dad wants it to look exactly like it is on the box to the point that he is taking Legos out of the kids pile putting the stuff together and, and the kids just kind of sitting there and he looks at the therapist and he says he always does this <laughs> you know <laughs> this always happens so um, first observing and then through the therapeutic process teaching parents to follow the kiddos lead um, behavioral and emotional responsiveness um, positive discipline if needed and then, you know, you observe the child. You rate the child as well. Does the child have a positive affect? You know, there's always an, a, a bit of an element of forced interaction. I, you, the parents are trying to put their, their best face, their, their best foot forward during these sorts of observations. But what's the tell, always, is how the kiddo responds. Because if the parent is acting in a way that is not typical of that interaction, 
you can tell by looking at the kiddo usually. You know, they kind of have that like, <laughs> this doesn't usually happen, look on their face. Um, are, they dis are they withdrawn? Are they fearful? Um, does the parent, is the parent giving instructions and the kiddo is like, whatever, you know, um, because they don't usually listen or need to. Um, do they have persistence with the task? How are they with the reunion? Some information on why you may include both parents or other caregivers um, that we have discussed. This slide really does address what I was talking about earlier with, you know, why, why observe with the foster parent, why observe with, with the current caregiver so you have that um, <laughs> contrast. And, the, and then we um, turn around a report. Now, we really try to turn around a report within 30 days. That's our goal because this really is to inform how to best serve this parent and child, how, what needs to happen to help re repair that parent-child relationship. So we don't want this process to go on forever. So we really try to do all of those um, observations, the interviews, all of that, and get a report turned around within 30 days. We have recommendations. Um, included in there about how to build on the strengths in the parent-child relationship, specific issues to be addressed in dyadic therapy if it's recommended, and any developmental intervention needs that need to be addressed. So you have the um, follow-up options. You certainly have the dyadic therapy. I talked about the family support option earlier. You know, one of the things that we note about parents oftentimes, though, and, and that's why we often look towards are there other providers in the home that we can um, coordinate services with and make sure that they understand what we're addressing in that dyadic therapy service and by dyadic I mean to you know it's th the parent and the child that's that's it and the focus is that relationship so that they're not overwhelmed with service providers coming into their home you know that you know so we can really make sure that we are using the resources that they already have the slide talks uh, um, actually about the kiddo that I referenced before um, Wary in his mom's presence, avoids eye contact, etc. Um, mom might act visibly nervous, uh, might be afraid to touch or comfort her child, um, you know, might verbalize a lot of concern, be kind of that overprotective mom during um, services, and then, you know, differences when observed with foster mom. So then the, the parent-child psychotherapy act, um, service, generally about 26 weeks, that's what it's, what it's designed to be, a 26-week course of therapy um, to promote and strengthen that close, safe, nurturing relationship between the parent and the child. We have observation, guidance, and coaching of the parent. Um, deals with parents unresolved, early abuse or trauma, which interferes in the present. Our job in this service is not to reprocess, to address. Our primary concern is not addressing that parent's history of abuse and neglect. It's important and we will address it in as much as it interferes with that parent's ability to respond to their child. But if they're involved in therapy um, with another provider to address that, then that stays with that provider. Does that make sense? The, the client, if you will, in this service is the relationship between the parent and the child. And as I said, it's, it's primarily um, an office-based. We have split um, sessions, some, some at home, because I think that really can help inform how things are going, um, fit bringing them into the office uh, periodically, um, because it is important. It's, it's amazing when you can videotape a parent with their child and then you can sit down and you can watch that film with the parent. Um, I mean, think about you know football coaches um, and how much film they watch so that they can you know be the best they can be. Their team can be the best they can be. Well, that's really what we're doing here. We're coaching, and in order to coach, you have to be able to watch what is and observe what is, and so you can show the parent, hey, look, look at look at your look at your kiddo's face right there. What do you think he's trying to communicate to you? Let's freeze this and let's talk about it. And you get an opportunity that you wouldn't have if you, you know, just kind of, if you didn't have the tape, if you just were doing in the moment all the time. 
back up there. Models for the parent-child therapy include um, PCIT, Watch, Wait, and Wonder, Interaction Guidance. So treatment outcomes, um, improved parent-child relationship, permanency, hopefully expedited permanency, um, improvement in the child developmental status, improvement in parent, uh, parental level of depression um, as it relates to that relationship and reduction of abuse and neglect. We talked about what the therapy ap approach includes. Family support, basically opportunities to practice under supervision. Um, this, this slide got tossed in when we um, were working a lot with um, going out and presenting to case managers because there has been a lot of confusion among our referral resources, the case managers in our Eastern Service area about, well, this family's involved with IFP. This family has an IFP team coming into the house. This, this parent's in, in substance abuse treatment. Uh, this parent receives, you know, other services. Why would we refer this service? And so, um, you know, put some information up about how that's different. Any individual therapy or treatment for mental health or substance abuse should continue during dyadic therapy. One of the stumbling blocks, I think, um, early on as we had our clinicians getting used to the service was, um, I would oftentimes hear, well, this mom, you know, I, I see what we could be doing in dyadic therapy, but gosh, she's, she's not too far advanced into her substance abuse treatment or you know she really needs to get stabilized on her medication for bipolar disorder and maybe this just isn't really the right time well it might not be an ideal time but the reality is that there's a clock I always envision my, my personal um, you know vision is this clock above the child's head and I think well okay so then what we wait, we wait until mom's further involved in substance abuse treatment or maybe, you know, her meds are stabilized and then maybe we have to wait on something else and the child's out of home longer and longer and longer and that relationship is disrupted longer and longer and longer and we're not teaching that parent how to better interact with her child. You know, so really working towards how do we help her right now and as she um, heals in other areas, then maybe we can speed up that process a little bit, maybe we change our focus, but I think we always just meet the parent where they're at. Some more information on training and preparation for Safe Start, and it looks like that is it.